I don't like the sound of my own voice. Inconceivable. If you were here on Sunday, you'll get that joke. All right, let's turn to Judges chapter 13. Uh, the big news, Pastor Ed already talked about it, and the reason we are meeting in this setting tonight, it's a little bit different than what we normally do on Wednesdays. Uh, we got VBS coming up just in about a week and a half. Uh, it's hard to believe it's here. We are very, very excited about this. Had a meeting on Sunday with uh, a lot of interested folks, small army of people here. Uh, it was great. We're having another meeting on Sunday. If you want to come and hear a little bit about what we're doing, how we're going to do it, uh, you can hear about how you can be involved next week. Uh, we're currently in the mode of making a bunch of props, making a bunch of decorations, and then next week we'll be actually kidding this place out, as they say in Ireland. Um, so if you're available tomorrow, starting at 10 a.m. or Friday, uh, come on up, help us paint, help us cut foam, just come help us uh, invest into the lives of these kids. And we're very, very excited. It's good to have Pastor Keith back in town. It was good to see him today. He had a safe trip. And this coming Sunday, don't forget, too, that we're going to be hearing from the Tanzania team. So the whole service is going to be dedicated to a report of how their missions trip went. And we're just looking forward to that. So I hope you'll be here on Sunday. Uh, but the reason I mentioned VBS and I held this up when I said so, use these, reach out to people, use our Facebook invites, just reach out to the community, target people that you know who have kids who might want to come and be a part. It's going to be a very exciting program this year. Okay, so we are in Judges chapter 13. And I'm, I'm in full-on superhero mode tonight. I'm sporting my new superhero shirt that Jenny made me. It was given to me on Father's Day. And the other day, Amanda was like, when are you going to wear that shirt that I gave you for Father's Day? So, I'm wearing it. Let's pray and go home. Just kidding. All right, Judges chapter 13. I don't like being this far away, but if I go down there, it's hard for people to see me on the internet, and that's what it's all about. So, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. I'm in, I'm in like, kid mode because... Um, of VBS. Pray for my daughter. I, I don't normally do this from the pulpit, but my daughter has had a fever since they got back from Tanzania, which is almost a week ago. Uh, so that they're checking her for malaria, um, mono, uh, just all different kinds of stuff, trying to find out what's going on. Um, so she's doing okay, but it's like peaks and valleys. She is fine one minute, and then she hits a low point. Her white blood cells were really low. You're supposed to have anywhere between 4,500 to 13,500. Hers were below 2,000. Um, so she's just really out of it, and we, we don't know what's going on yet. So anyway, just keep her in prayer. Okay, I've said this three times now, Judges chapter 13. Um, let's pray one more time. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together tonight uh, to study your word. Uh, always an exciting thing to look at your word together, Father. Thank you that you over centuries took the time to have your word written down. And we know, Jesus, you told us that not one jot or one tittle of the law will pass away. This is the eternal word of God. And, and you, Jesus, are the living word, the word made flesh. And we come here tonight with hearts full of anticipation because we know when we study your word, when we truly submit ourselves to it and give ourselves over to it, it's, it's less about information, and it's more about an encounter with you, the living God, the one who saved us, who is at wor who's working in our lives, changing us from the inside out. And I just pray that tonight is a part of that, that you breathe upon this time by your Holy Spirit, and that you come and minister to every heart in this room in a way that only you can. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Judges chapter 13, we have um, arguably reached... The most famous, maybe I should say infamous, uh, part of the book of Judges. We come now to uh, the last judge in the book of Judges. Not the last judge of Israel, but the last judge in the book of Judges. And that, of course, is Samson. Uh, we've looked recently at another major judge, Jephthah. Uh, we saw sort of the conclusion of his account on Sunday. And then we saw three minor judges uh, towards the end of chapter 12, Ibsen, Elon, and, Abdon and uh, Abdon, and then tonight, we begin the account of Samson. Samson has four chapters dedicated to him in the book of Judges. And, you know, the, the study of Samson is really a study in contrasts. 
What you have here is a man with incredible strengths, but incredible weaknesses. And you see in the course of his career as a judge, high highs and low lows. It's been said, Samson, I just said this, it's been said, Samson is a study in contrast, a man of great strengths and great weaknesses. He's an example of unfulfilled potential. Though he did great things for God, it is staggering to think what he might have been and done. And I think that, you know, the account of, uh, the account of Samson, one of the things that, that really stands out in this account is the importance of finishing well. You know, when you look at a marathon, there's really two parts of a marathon or any great race that you watch. And of course, you know, there's the starting uh, and you watch kind of this mass of people start off from the starting point. But what really matters is crossing that finish line. You know, very few people look back on a race and talk about how great a runner did when he started, when the firing pistol went off. What matters is, did he cross the finish line? Uh, did he finish well? And I think that's so relevant to us in our walk with the Lord. You know, Paul the Apostle, at the end of his life, he's there in prison in Rome, and he's able to say, I have fought the good fight. You know, I have run the race. You know, he didn't say, I almost finished. When Jesus Christ hung on the cross, he didn't say, almost. He said, it is done, paid in full. And there's such an example in that for us as believers. You know, we're called to follow the example of Jesus and our mentality is, it is done. It should be that we're going to run this race in such a way that we're going to win, that we're going to cross the finish line. Samson starts well. He does not necessarily finish well. Um, he does finish, and yes, there's a degree of victory at the end of his life, but he's a man who makes tremendous compromises and we see, of course, the effect that has on him. So let's dig in. Uh, we read again, the children of Israel in verse 1 did evil in the sight of the Lord. Of, I'll emphasize the again because we have seen that over and over in the book of Judges. It's the vicious cycle of the book of Judges where the children of Israel are experiencing a season of, of peace and then they buy into sin. Most of the time it's worshiping the false gods of the people groups around them and then God hands them over into an oppressor. He raises up a people group, the Midianites, the Philistines, who we see tonight, you know, the, the Ammonites, all these different groups. God lets them make the choice that they make. He raises up an oppressor. And then for a season, they go through this time of tremendous oppression until they finally cry out. And then God is faithful to raise up a, a champion, which is where we get our word judges from. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So this is a long time that they're going to be oppressed by the Philistines. Now, we read in verse 2, there was a certain man from Zorah. Zorah is in the land of the tribe of Dan, about 14 miles west of Jerusalem, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was, as we often read in Scripture, barren. Uh, she had no children. But the angel of the Lord, verse 3 tells us, appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Uh, this reference to the angel of the Lord, we talked about this in chapter 2, when the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal and appeared to the children of Israel in Bochim. We saw it in chapter 6, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. Uh, this is... Another example of an Old Testament pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. So pre-Bethlehem, before being born as a baby, as a, as a human being, this is Jesus himself appearing in the Old Testament. It's sometimes referred to as a Christophany or a Theophany. And we're going to see certain clues tonight as we did when we looked in chapter 2 and in chapter 6. It's some of the things that indicate uh, how we can discern that this is in fact the Lord himself. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman, uh, Zora's, uh, sorry, uh, Manoah's wife, and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. That'll become relevant towards the end of Samson's account. 
No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be, check this out, a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So he's going to be a Nazarite. The vow of the Nazarite was a three-part vow. You see it described over in uh, Numbers chapter 6. There were three things that a Nazarite was not allowed to do. And by the way, I should say here that uh, when one typically took the vow of the Nazarite, it would be for um, a certain period of time. You know, it might be a year, might be a year and six months or whatever. So it is unusual to see in the account of Samson that he is going to be, from the time he is born, consecrated as a Nazarite. That's unusual. But there were three things a Nazarite was not supposed to do. He was not supposed to drink wine or eat anything made out of grapes. He was not supposed to cut his hair or shave. Uh, He was also not supposed to touch anything that was dead. Now, what we're going to see in the account of Samson is that he breaks all three of those of the Nazarite vow. Um, The idea behind the vow of the Nazarite was... In not drinking wine, you were abstaining from earthly pleasure. You were not going to get intoxicated. It was a way of, we could say it's almost like fasting. You're going to abstain from something in order that you might deny the flesh and consecrate your holy, your, yourself holy to God. Um, you were not to cut your hair or, or shave, you know, and, and in doing so, you were demonstrating that physical appearance did not matter to you. It was more important to you to be set aside for the Lord himself. And then by not touching anything that was dead, you were denying yourself the ability to get close to a loved one who had died. Uh, you, you, know, you couldn't attend a funeral or anything like that. So it was a way of, you were, as a Nazarite, you were a walking living, breathing advertisement, so to speak, of what it looked like to be set aside for the service of the Lord. So three things, not drinking wine, not cutting your hair, not touching anything dead. Okay, here's what's interesting about the vow of the Nazarite. When you think about 1 John chapter 2, there we read that, you know, don't love the world or all that is in the world. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those same three things are what is reflected in the vow of the Nazarite. The lust of the flesh. We're not to live a life where we just give ourselves over to fleshly pleasure. Same principle behind a Nazarite denying himself or herself or himself, I should say, wine. Okay, the lust of the eyes, not being concerned with how things looked. Same idea behind a Nazarite, not cutting his hair, not shaving. The pride of life, having no earthly attachment that would supersede your service and your honor and your devotion towards the Lord. Now, take it back even further than that. Okay, you got the vow of the Nazarite, three-part vow. 1 John chapter 2 says to you and I as modern day Christians, don't love the world or the things that are in the world because everything that's in the world falls into one of three categories, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Go all the way back to the garden. When Eve was deceived, what do we read? Three things. When she saw that the fruit was good for food, was pleasant to the eyes, and was desirable to make one wise. It's the same three things. Good for food. What's that? The lust of the flesh. Wanting to eat it because you knew it would satisfy you in a fleshly, carnal way. Good for food. Pleasant to the eyes. That's the lust of the eyes. And desirable to make one wise. Taking a lot of pride in your esteem. Your earthly perception or reputation, we might say. Why go into all that? Okay, because you see these same three things reflected in the temptation of Eve in the garden, in the vow of the Nazarite, to you and I today, 
as Christians, as New Testament believers, the reality is Satan comes after us in the same three categories today. Satan has not changed his approach at all in how he comes after man. It's one of those same three things. When we give in to sin, it's either because we want to feel good or we want to look good or because we're proud and we have an incredibly high reputation of ourself and we'll do something to preserve that perception. That's how the enemy comes after us. Now, why is that important? Because Scripture tells us that we're not to be ignorant concerning his devices. You look at any sin that you get tripped up with in your life. Porn, what's that? Lust of the eyes, right? Think about drugs, alcohol, what's that? Lust of the flesh, sleeping around, right? Sex. Now, sex in marriage is great, right? It's honorable, but not outside. Why, why, why do we give in to that? Because of the lust of the flesh. Why will we step on people, right, to, to make our way to the top in, in our career or whatever? It's the pride of life. It's always these same three things. You can look at what the enemy does and how he trips us up. He appeals to one of these three things, so we have to be on our guard when it comes to the temptations of the enemy, not to be ignorant of his devices. So this was the vow of the Nazarite. Now again, we're going to see how Samson breaks all three of these areas of this vow, the vow of the Nazarite. It's also interesting to note too, at the end of verse 5, we read, no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. Check out, check this out. It's so subtle. We read, he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. G. Campbell Morgan talks about how there is this weird reference here that you can see right from the beginning, right from before he's even born, there's, there's the foreknowledge of he's not going to necessarily see this through. He's going to begin to deliver the children of Israel. There's another reference to that even later in this chapter. Just really interesting to note, really interesting to point out. So the woman, verse 6, came, told her husband, saying, a man of God came to me. In most of your Bibles, not all, but most of them, the, the man there will be capitalized. That's a slight way of the translators recognizing that there was something special about this individual. A man of God came to me, and check this out, his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. So he's in the form of man, but he's like God. First, first sort of reference, first sort of hint there that there's something interesting about this individual. Very awesome, she says, but I did not ask him where he was from, and he didn't tell me his name. She was so stupefied at this individual that it, she didn't even think to ask who he was, where he was from. She just ran home to get her husband, Manoah. Verse 7, and he said to me, now she's just kind of summarizing what we just read about the angel and what he communicated to her. Verse 7, behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. It's, it's, it's interesting and important, I think, to note that even before Samson was born, as he was going to be in this woman, she was not to drink wine or intoxicating drink because that would, in essence, pass to him. So she was to honor the vow of the Nazarite as well in preparing for her son to be born. You know, we a lot of different applications you could make there. But, I mean, the most immediate one for me as a parent is the fact that the way that I live does affect my children. The, the things that I do, whether directly or indirectly, does affect my kids. You know, I, I get on to my kids. If you've spent any time around Kaysen and Avon, you know, Kaysen and Avon, man, well, you guys know, you've seen them. You know, we were over at the Ernst the other night, this is before Amanda came back, and, you know, Avin's just a bruiser. He is, man. He's going to be a football player, and he just, like, he, he pushed Simon down, and, you know, Jacob, in his wisdom, was like, your son just pushed my son down, and I was like, okay, you know, so I got to go deal with them, and 
You know, it used to be where Cason was a lot larger than Avon. And now Avon has essentially caught up to where Cason is. Still two years younger than him. But, of course, you know, we used to say to Cason, look, you know, your brother, he's, he's learning, and, he, you know, you can't hit him back. You're, too, you know, you're a lot bigger than him. And so the other day, you know, I'm watching Cason and Avon play, and, and Avon just walks up to Cason, and, I mean, just, boom, just clocks him in the back, you know, just like a kidney punch, just for no reason, just boom. And, you know, Cason comes up to me and goes, Avon hit me. I'm like, well, hit him back, you know. You're, it's that time. But there's some, well, I, yeah, now you all are all thinking, gosh, you know, horrible parenting tactics. But my point is, is that there's times when I look at my children and I think, where, where did your temper come from? You know, I'm like, where, where did you get this bad temper? What is wrong with you? You know, why are you yelling at your brother? Uh, oh, 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 yeah, you know, and it's like you realize that what you model for your kids, they just pick up on it, and they emulate it. So it's so important for us as parents, or just as adults in the church for the kids that are around us, that we, like Paul said to Timothy, be an example to the believers in word, and faith, and love, and purity, and all those things. So, She's not to partake of the same things that would break the vow of the Nazarite. She's not to drink wine or intoxicating drink. She's not to touch anything unclean. Verse 8, Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and tell us what we shall do for the child who will be born. So he's believing what his wife's telling him. Because he's praying and he's, he's acknowledging that the child will be born. But at the same time, too, he's asking for confirmation. There's a lot of wisdom in that. There's a lot of wisdom in when you believe the Lord speaks, when you believe the Lord is directing. I mean, you got to be careful. You don't want to start down this avenue, <laughs> kind of like we saw with, with Gideon, you know, where, where he lays out a fleece and God answers the fleece. And then he lays out another fleece. You know, we got to be careful that we're not always seeking confirmation to the point that we're not acting on what we clearly know God has told us. But in this particular instance, the angel of the Lord has appeared to Manoah's wife. Now she's telling him, and he's not necessarily doubting her. He's acknowledging in his prayer what God has told her, but he is asking for confirmation. Let the, let the man of God, let, the, let this messenger appear to us again. Verse 9, and God listened. To the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And then the woman ran in haste, verse 10, and told her husband and said to him, look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared to me. So Manoah arose and followed his wife. And when he came to the man, he said to him, are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Another hint that we're probably looking at a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ here. Of course, this is a reference to Exodus chapter 3. Remember when uh, the Lord's trying to send Moses down to Egypt to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage, and he's kind of going through his litany of questions. Well, I'm not a good speaker, and you know, what if they don't believe me? And one of the questions he says is, he says, well, what if they ask me your name, God? And God responds with, I am who I am. And, I mean, this was considered illegal to utter. When you read through the New Testament Gospels, you see that occasion when Jesus is dialoguing with the Pharisees. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones to kill him. Don't let anybody ever come to you and say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Because in uttering that statement... I am, they knew that he was claiming to be God. And so when Manoah says to this mysterious visitor, are you the man who appeared to this woman? His response is, I am. He utters the same name of God that he spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Manoah said, verse 12, now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? Typical father here, right? 
What's his career going to be? <laughs> What's he going to end up doing for the rest of his life? So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I said, of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. I think it's interesting that, you know, his wife comes and tells him about this man who appeared to her and Manoah prays and he's like, you know, if, you know, Lord appear again and um, God listens. And now Manoah is asking another question. What, what's his line of work going to be? And this time God doesn't answer him. So to me, there's a tremendous sort of lesson in prayer here. Yes, you should ask for confirmation of the word of God. God will listen to you. But check this out. God doesn't always answer every single prayer we pray. There's some instances when we pray something, and it's not necessarily something that we need to be asking, and the Lord just doesn't respond to it. You know, I, to me, one of the most sobering books of the Bible is Job. And, you know, when you read the account of Job, most people, when you say that statement, when you make the statement of, you know, Job being a really sobering book, most people think of the early chapters, the chapters when, you know, Satan comes before the Lord, and he you know, he's trying to get at Job, and I mean, God essentially offers Job. He's like, have you, you know, you considered my servant Job? He's the most righteous man on the earth, and the Lord, Satan's like, well, of course, you know, you put a hedge of protection around him, and he, I mean, wipes out everything he owns. He kills his family, and finally, God gives him permission to strike his body, and he gets these boils all over him, and his wife's like, why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, just horrible, you know? But those aren't the chapters that are the most sobering to me. The chapters that are the most sobering to me in the account of Job are the closing chapters. And here's what's sobering about the closing chapters of the book of Job. Job never gets an answer as to why what happened happened. The only answer he gets is, I'm God and I can do whatever I want. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, of course. But if you read the account of Job, that's his answer. The reality is, God doesn't have to explain himself to us. He owes us no explanation for why he's doing what he's doing. I mean, it's so sobering when, you know, Job goes through all these questions, and then God shows up in a whirlwind, and he says, Job, do me a favor, stand up. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Where were you when I created everything? And he starts interrogating Job. Job's response is not how arrogant of the Lord. His response is, you know, I thought I knew what I was talking about. And I thought I knew who you were. But now my eyes have been opened and I really see. What we all need to answer the lingering whys in our life isn't necessarily the answer to the why. It's a fresh revelation of the who. It's a deeper revelation of who God is. In this day and age, man, when so many aspersions are being cast on the character of God, you and I, as his children, need to be so steeped, not, not in head knowledge, I'm talking about in a walk with him, an intimate relationship with him, that we can speak with knowledge and authority and certainty about who he is and take that message to a lost and hurting world. I mean, Satan's done an effective job at convincing people out there that God's the bad guy. The problem is he's doing a really good job of doing the same thing in the church. Th there may be people sitting in the room here tonight or listening at home who are struggling in their walk with God, not because of circumstances, but because they doubt God. They have moved away from a certainty that they had of who he was. And the answer to that is not changed circumstances. The answer to that is a fresh revelation of who God is. And in those times, what we need to do is hit our knees and seek his face. 
See, when we, when we seek his face and we are so focused on who he is, and I can testify to this in my own life, and do I go through you know, ups and downs and peaks and valleys just like every other person? Of course I do. Do I go through seasons of doubt and questioning? Of course I do. But I can tell you that any time I have made my focus him and his face, not changed circumstances and not even an answer, just him, it changes everything. Your perspective is completely altered. You know, it's like the old example of, you know, if you were to take a, a quarter, you know, or a nickel, you know, and hold it up, you can block out the sun. And that quarter is infinitesimal in comparison to the actual size of the sun burning in our sky, right? It's perspective. It's perspective. When I allow my circumstances or my problems to loom large, it blocks my perspective of God. I need to get closer to the sun to realize how small those problems and those challenges and those circumstances really are. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, Manoah prays this prayer, and he says, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? He says, I am. Manoah says, Let your words come to pass, verse 12. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I have commanded her, let her observe. And then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you, and we will prepare a young goat for you. Now this is an interesting response. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. So this is another little hint here. He's already been described in the appearance of a man, but, but like God, he, he's already answered a question with, I am, something that was not utterable to the Hebrews. And here he's saying, I'm not going to eat your food, but I will accept your sacrifice. And this was a sacrifice that only the Lord was supposed to receive. And then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name? Check this out, seeing it is wonderful. Think about Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, when we read about Jesus in that Old Testament prophecy. His name will be called, what? Wonderful, right? And that word for wonderful means beyond understanding. So, okay, here you've got, he's in the form of a man or the appearance of a man, but he's like the messenger of God. He's said, I am. He says, I'm not going to eat your food, but I'll accept the sacrifice that's supposed to be reserved only for the Lord. What's your name? My name is Wonderful. Same name given to Jesus himself. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock to the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. What was the wondrous thing that he did? Verse 20, it happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. Another hint. He's ascended into heaven here. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. So you can see all the little hints peppered in there about why we may look at this and recognize it as another theophany or Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And the angel of the Lord, verse 21, appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, now here's another hint here, because he says, we shall surely die because we have seen God. That's a pretty... Bold declaration here. And Manoah was probably familiar with Exodus chapter 33, where God said to Moses, no man shall see me and live. But you start adding up all these things. In the form of a man, but in appearance is God, I am, my name is wonderful, I'll receive the sacrifice that only God's supposed to receive. We've seen God. 
Lots of little hints in there. We shall surely die because we have seen God. But this is so cool to me. His wife says to him, if the Lord had desired to kill us, I mean, this is, this is a maturity of perspective here. And, and, you know, I would say that Manoah is probably just reacting to what he's just seen. I mean, he's seen something amazing. He's seen this miraculous figure receive this sacrifice and then get caught up to heaven in the flame of fire. And I mean, he just, boom, we're going to die. He's just bowled over with fear and wonder and awe all at once. I mean, to me, this is, this is kind of like John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos. When he sees the revelation of Jesus Christ, what does he do? He falls down at his feet as though he were dead. And I mean, John knew Jesus. John had walked with Jesus for three years. John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's how John describes himself. But when he had that revelation of the awe and wonder of the Lord, like Isaiah, right? When Isaiah is going around in the first few chapters of his prophecy, and he's pronouncing woes on everybody. And then when he sees the Lord high and lifted up, he says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. See, there again, that's what gives us a right perspective on who we are, is a right perspective of who he is. That's what changes everything. And Manoah just reacts. He falls down. He says, we're going to die because we've seen God. And I set all this up to now compare it to the perspective of his wife. And I love this. And she says, if the Lord, if God desired to kill us, he, he wouldn't have accepted the burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us such things as these at this time. I mean, her, her reasoning here is so sound. If God was going to kill us, why, why would he appear to me and tell me that I'm going to have a child and that the child's going to be a Nazarite and that I have to abstain from wine and grapes and not touch anything unclean. And then on top of that, Manoah, when you asked for him to appear again, he did. And then he answers your prayers. Why would he go through that litany of things just to kill us? But how many times have we thought those same things? How, how many times have we doubted what God has done and questioned what his motives are in our life? True stories of a pastor time. I was, uh, the, first, the first Sunday I was here, this was back in October, I think it was October 9th or October 12th, 2016, you know, it was the first Sunday that I was here, and we had made the decision to move out here, and uh, we, had a, we had a service where Bill Holdridge was uh, sharing, and then um, Evans, what's, what was his name? The other pastor with Poyman. I can't even think of his name. I always say Chris Evans, but that's Captain America. Phil, Phil Evans. Yeah, I knew it wasn't Tony Evans. He's an entirely different guy. But, you know, you know, we had Bill Holdridge there, then you had Phil Evans share, and the whole time I'm sitting in the back of the room, I'm thinking I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm going to have a heart attack. I was so nervous. We were just talking before the service, and somebody made the comment about singing on the worship team, about how nervous they get before they, they sing. And I, I made the comment. I said, I, I go through the same thing. You know, people have no idea how nervous you get in doing something like this. And I'll, I'll never forget just sitting back there and thinking to myself, this, oh, you know, th this is it. This is, you know, God brought me to Yuba City to kill me, you know, to, to put me up in front of all these people and, and cause me to have a heart attack. I thought, this is it. And, you know, and your prayer life is just like, well, okay, Lord, if this is where you take me, this is where you take me, you know, and it's, it's very similar to this. You know, the Holy Spirit's going, what, what are you talking about? Why, why would he put you through all the different things to get you here to have you take the pulpit just to smite you. But that's the world's perspective of God, and that so often can be our perspective. 
of God. I, I know that I've shared this with you before, because as I've said, you know, pastors only have a certain number of illustrations, so you just like recycle them as often as you can and hope that the audience is different. Um, but there's a, remember the far side? You've heard me share this with you before, the far side. There's that old, I used to have a cutout of this in my office because I would show it to people when they would come in for counseling, dealing with the, these types of thoughts. I would say, this is, your perspe- this is your perception of God. And it was a picture of an old man, you know, with a beard and a gown, sitting in front of a computer screen. And on the computer screen was a guy wearing a baseball cap and suspended over his head was a piano with rope. And the old man had his finger over a computer button, and written on the computer button, it said, Smite. And the caption read, God at his computer. Because that's our perception so often, is God's just sitting in front of his computer, waiting to hit the smite button. Boom. Flat tire? Boom. Right? I got a flat tire the other day. I left church. Left church on Sunday, and went out to my car. Flat tire. Drove all the way home on a flat tire because I didn't want to change a tire in the heat. And I thought, well, I can either walk, or I can call my wife and have her come pick me up, or I can drive home on a flat tire. So I drove home on a flat tire. Later that night, changed the tire, put on my spare, came out 30 minutes later, spare's flat, flat tire, right? (laughs) Smite God at his computer, right? And we can think that. Listen, listen. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, okay, check this out. You've already been judged. You've already been declared righteous. That means God is not doing things to you on a daily basis to judge you because you've already been declared innocent. So Christianity is not about coming before, you know, the big whatever they're called, the bench where the judge sits with a gavel, you know, probably my son. He's probably, you know, Kaysen probably hauled off and hit him. Finally. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm losing my train of thought here. But that, God's not bringing us before, you know, the, the judgment, you know, I don't want to call it the judgment seat because then somebody's going to get all theo- theological on me and talk about how we are going to stand before the judgment seat. That's entirely different. That's not about salvation or guilt or innocence. That's about our works. Okay. Just had to take care of that. But we're not coming before the bench every day, and the Lord going, okay, I threw you into that situation with the flat tire, and now let me see how you react. Boom, guilty. No, because you've already been declared innocent. You're already righteous. You don't have to come before the bench over and over and over. Check this out. This whole passage reminds me of, and I'm not going to ask you to, to turn there. I would encourage you to jot it down, though, or make a note. Go home tonight Read Romans chapter 5, the opening verses of Romans chapter 5. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read them to you. I'm going to get through the first few verses here, because then I want to emphasize a point. But I want you to follow along with me here. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that... But we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. Check this out. Because when we were still without strength, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now follow Paul's train of thought here. Okay, while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his love toward us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Listen, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Because if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved by his life? Okay, did you follow that? If when you were a sinner, God died to reconcile you, then how much more is God going to work in your life now that you're his kid through his life? That's mind-boggling when you think about it. Much more than 
That's a passage to be steeped in when you start having those doubtful ideas like Manoah. To come back to and go, now wait a minute, wait a minute. Listen to the reasoning of the Holy Spirit. Listen to the eternal word of God. If when you were alienated from God, he went to the lengths of dying for you to bring him to himself. Now that you're his kid, what's he going to do on your behalf through being alive? Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. And so she reasons with her husband from this stance, really. If the Lord desired to kill us, he wouldn't have accepted our burnt offering. He, he would not have shown us all these things. He wouldn't have told us such things at this time. So the woman, indeed, verse 24, bore a son, called his name Samson, and the child grew. The Lord blessed him. Check this out. And the spirit of the Lord. Now, now here's the other subtle reference. The spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahana Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. Once again, it's that weird reference there. Kind of like we read earlier about how he shall begin to deliver Israel. Here we read the spirit of the Lord began to move upon him. And I believe that in as much as this is the birth of Samson, this is a tremendous at times hero coming onto the scene Still, at the very onset, there's also the awareness of his ultimate failure. That he would begin to deliver Israel. That the Spirit of the Lord began to move on him. But that's not necessarily how things pan out for him. Tremendous study and contrasts, Samson. So I encourage you, go home, read ahead. We're not going to be in Judges on Sunday. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to hear from the Tanzania team. But next Wednesday... We'll continue into chapter 14. We'll look at Samson and his Philistine wife. So why don't you guys come up, close us with a song. Let's pray. Don't forget we got the hot dogs outside tonight. If you want to stick around, have hot dogs, chips, and a drink. Uh, but before you do, go grab your screaming kids out of our children's ministry. Go grab my screaming kid out of children's ministry. I'm kidding. I love my children. I do. Oh, Lord. No one's looking at me. Father, thank you for your word. So good. So good, Lord. Much more than having been reconciled, we'll be, we shall be saved from wrath through his life. Oh, that's amazing, Jesus. Thank you for the reminder tonight of your incredible love for us. Lord, I just pray that we would all now in these last few moments as we conclude. Let us not unplug spiritually. Lord, as we sort of allow your word now to kind of sink into the soil of our hearts, I just pray, Lord, if there's any of us in the room tonight that have been going through seasons of doubt, that we would bring those things to you, that we would acknowledge those thoughts to you, and we would just seek your face afresh tonight. Fill us up afresh with your Holy Spirit tonight. God, we are absolutely dependent upon you. And as you've told us in your word, without me, you can do nothing. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Thank you that you have appeared to us, that you have visited us, that you've sent us your son to demonstrate your love for us. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for tonight. Watch over us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all.